наверное, начинается наше время. Ольга Владимировна, вы хотели бы открыть? Да, здравствуйте, дорогие коллеги. Рада вас приветствовать вновь на этом замечательном мероприятии. У нас сейчас идет параллельно мероприятие на Европейской ассоциации, российской группы нашей, поэтому я через полчасика вас покину. Но я вам хочу сказать, что ресурс Digital Science и его приложение – и его состав – это очень интересные ресурсы. Я думаю, что мы в дальнейшем будем очень подробно их изучать и рассматривать с точки зрения применения для, наших, для нашей работы в редакционной издательской деятельности, как с авторами, так и внутри редакции. И первое мероприятие мы уже провели несколько дней назад – касалась редакционной системы по написанию английских англоязычных статей. И вот сегодня у нас второе такое мероприятие. Я желаю полезного просмотра и прослушивания. И думаю, что вы сможете применить это так же, как и Rightful в своей деятельности. Желаю хорошего времяпрепровождения с коллегами. Спасибо, Ольга Владимировна. Скажу всего два слова. Уважаемые коллеги, приветствуем вас и благодарим Анри за возможность совместного проведения таких вот этой серии мастер-классов. Прошлый первый мастер-класс нашел ну, просто огромный отклик. Мы до сих пор собираем запросы на, на тестовый доступ к Ратифу. Спасибо вам большое за, за такой интерес. Вот. Сегодня мы расскажем про еще одно совершенно уникальное решение, которым пользуются более 5 миллионов человек во всем мире. Это Overleaf, и его основатель Джон Хаммерсли расскажет нам про, собственно говоря, про возможности. Скажу только, что несмотря на то, что это такое вот решение не российское, но международное, тем не менее, мы недавно смотрели статистику использования Overleaf в индивидуальном порядке и увидели, что несколько десятков тысяч человек в России активно пользуются платформой, и некоторые из пользователей Overleaf также являются советниками развития платформы. То есть Россия здесь как бы крайне вовлечена как, как, как научная держава в, в развитии вот этой технологии. И мы также видим, что Overleaf поддерживает около 40 языков, включая русский язык. То есть мы видим как бы абсолютно такую вот дружественную историю с этой страны. Uh, let me introduce uh, John Hammersley, um, who is the co-founder of Overleaf. And um, again, uh, greeting everyone uh, today um, at uh, Association of Science Publishers and Editors uh, in, in Russia. Uh, this is um, a publishing audience. So I'm asking uh, John to, to um, roll this out as, as you know, having this in mind that, that we're having a, a publisher's audience and uh, give us a, a, a wide perspective on the Overleaf itself, uh, and then uh, showcase live um, uh, some of the features that, that, that are relevant for authors and publishers, and what can be done uh, together with, with the publishers at Overleaf uh, platform. Over to you, John, thank you. And then we'll have a Q&A session. Well, thanks, Igor, and hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. I will share my screen um, and run through um, a few Slides before, as Igor says, I will um, take a look at the live overleaf site and run through a few things there. Um, so yes, I'm John Hammersley. I'm one of the founders of Overleaf. I'm a mathematician originally. Um, I used to write research papers um, and indeed Overleaf um, was created to help us collaborate um, more easily on, on our research papers that we were writing. The world, uh, the world of, of sort of writing, scientific writing, technical writing, research writing is becoming more collaborative. Um, there's been a number of different studies over the last maybe 20 or 30 years which have shown how more and more papers are being produced with more and more international co-authors. 
Um, you can see this as an example from the Royal Society, um, where they looked at the proportion of the world's papers with more than one international author. And it was steadily growing. You know, this study is a little bit old now, it's nine years old, but the trend has continued, um, as you would expect, as, as more and more people are connected between different universities um, and different research institutions around the world. And there is also a benefit to writing collaborative articles, um, because as you get more authors involved, you have more authors that will then share it within their, that within their groups, will be able to go to conferences to talk about the, the research. And so you typically see that collaborative papers often get picked up more um, in follow-up research. Um, so there's a benefit as an author for writing collaboratively, um, and there's a benefit for the research itself in, in reaching a wider audience. Um, but collaboration is typically very frustrating. Um, you know, I, I love this comic um, because it shows two people who are actually based in the same building um, who, who get into these situations that I think we all have with these fi long file names with revision 22, comments 49, you know, all of these files and files um, trying to track the different versions of the document. And, and this is what you do, you end up with multiple versions of the same document. There's usually a lot of email chains passing these documents around. Formatting and typesetting can be a real problem for authors, um, especially if they are writing technical work, which involves equations, symbols, mathematics, um, or complicated figures or complicated um, parts to the paper. Um, maintaining references is often difficult as well and, and keeping the cross references and the citations accurate throughout the article. And quite often you get into long revision cycles, you know, whether it's between the authors themselves or when it comes to publishing, there's often a lot of back and forth to try and get an article ready for, for publishing. And, and I say article, I think, you know, this is people at all ends of the the research spectrum. So starting from students who are maybe writing their, their dissertations or their first research papers through to established researchers and established professors who, who are, you know, writing, been writing for a long time, but still find these issues in, in going through the publication process. And um, so Overleaf was really designed to make collaboration easy. Um, it is based on LaTeX, um, which is a typesetting language. Um, if you've never heard of LaTeX before, it's a little bit like HTML in that you can write your content, um, tag it up with certain commands, and then LaTeX, when it compiles the document, will, will use those commands to make a professional, nicely typed up version done at the end. Um, but Overleaf does make it easier to get started. So whereas traditionally to use LaTeX, you had to install something on your own computer, it might not work straight away, you might need to install other things. Overleaf removes that problem. You just use it online in the browser. I mean, it also means that you and your co-authors are all accessing the same document, you're all looking at the same text, and it really reduces the issues of having multiple versions of the document um, passing around. Uh, because we've made it really easy to use, we've actually grown um, very significantly, very quickly. So. We started um, back in sort of the beginning of 2013. Um, we've actually, last year we celebrated 5 million users and we're actually, we've just hit 6 million users worldwide um, just this past uh, few weeks. And um, we also have a big user support team because the other good thing about documents that are in the cloud is not only can authors, um, you know, collaborate in it and, and see the same version of the document, but others as well. So this helps us if a user gets in touch and says, I'm having a problem with my document, um, provided they're okay for us to take a look, we can make sure we can see what the problem is and often help them very quickly. And this is also very beneficial in the editorial cycle because one of the problems that editors often have is that they might see an issue with a paper that the author doesn't see when they look at it on their computer and you're sort of talking past each other a little bit. Um, this makes it easy using Overleaf for all of the parties involved to see where any issues are and sort of fix them together, whether it's the editor making track changes or leaving comments or whether it's the author um, doing it from their perspective. And so everyone being able to see the same version of the document um, is very beneficial for that. So if you're new to Overleaf, 
Um, I'm new to LaTeX, how do you get started? Um, well, first of all, there's over 6,000 templates in the gallery. Um, I'll show a few of these a bit later on. These range from journal templates to other types of academic article templates like preprint server templates, um, but also things like dissertation templates, letter templates, presentation templates, and poster templates. And it's designed to make it easy for authors to create whatever type of document they need to without them having to worry um, about the formatting. So they write the content and the template handles the formatting. Um, we also have a learn wiki and um, with a lot of good getting started guides. So if you've never used LaTeX before, we have a learn LaTeX in 30 minutes guide, which will get you all the way to creating your first document. Um, if you're more used to LaTeX, if you're more experienced and there's more guides to getting more out of the advanced features um, out of Overleaf. If you've, again, if you've never seen Overleaf before, this is a screenshot from the editor. So you'd write your paper in that middle pane there. And on the right-hand side, you'd see it compiled according to the template you've chosen. So here, this is a template for the Genetics Society. Um, and as you can see, it's a very familiar looking, if anyone see, you know, for journal articles, there's a sort of quite a standard type of layout with the abstract at the top. Um, and then a two column layout with various stylings for headers and footers and um, uh, you know, the author information. And the good thing is that the author doesn't have to try and sort out that layout. They write their paper and the template handles that, handles that layout. Um, you may notice that the, the middle pane doesn't look like LaTeX commands. Um, that's because we have a rich text mode. Um, you can see the, the option at the top, the toggle. Um, that lets people who are not familiar with LaTeX at all or prefer to edit in a more WYSIWYG environment to, to write in something that looks more familiar. But for anyone who is used to LaTeX, you can edit with the full power of LaTeX in source mode. Um, and because Overleaf is designed for collaboration, it has things like track changes and commenting um, and the ways to interact with authors and, and the ways to sort of, you know, um, see who's changed what in a document. Again, which is helpful both for authors, um, but also if, um, if editors are working on the same document. Um, it helps everyone sort of see um, who's made which comments and, and who's made which changes. So we do work with publishers sort of across um, different fields and different specialities and, and different sizes. Um, because I feature the genetics template, I just wanted to highlight this case study from a few years ago. Um, we set up the LaTeX template for them. Um, and now more than two thirds of all their LaTeX submissions come in via Overleaf, using the Overleaf template and, and the Overleaf platform. And it's made it a lot easier for them to continue to process the, the papers because, because the author has been able to communicate a bit more about how they wanted things to look. Um, it makes it easier for the, the journal team to understand you know, what the author's thought, thinking was around how the, the, the paper should look. And so helps reduce some of the back and forth that, it, that goes on during the, the sort of final um, production process. Um, I should add that, yeah, we work across the spectrum. So we, we've done a lot of work with people like the IEEE and Springer, Springer Nature, um, but we also work with um, preprint servers and repositories. We work with the technologies behind the journal. So the manuscript systems like ScholarOne, Editorial Manager, and eJournal Press. And then we also have integrations with things like Mendeley and Zotero um, for pulling in bibliography information. So we try and make it easy for authors to use the tools that they need when they're writing, and then also to submit to the, the different journals and the different places that, that they need to submit to depending on their field. Um, I should add that Overleaf is designed to work um, in many different languages. So there are templates in the gallery um, which are multilingual or which are based in, which are, are written in different alphabets. Um, there's also spell check in over 40 languages on the site. Um, you also notice on this screenshot, there are things like Dropbox integration, Git integration and GitHub integration. So again, this is designed to fit into the author's workflow and designed to help them write their paper in, in the best way and keep it up to date um, with all the, you know, the associated files and associated data or associated um, supplementary materials that might 
might be needed when they submit their paper. And we get a lot of love for Overleaf on Twitter. And again, it comes down to those two points really that um, A, you don't have to install anything. So you can get started with LaTeX much more easily um, than you can if you have to install it locally. Um, but then also if you're writing collaboratively um, with lots of other co-authors, again, it just removes that need to email files back and forth and makes it much easier for authors to, to get their paper done um, more quickly. Um, as Igor mentioned, you know, this, we do have um, quite a lot of um, relationships within the publishing community. Um, and we did quite a lot of work a few years ago um, to try and um, work out ways in which we could help streamline the submission process. So we do that in a few different ways. So one is by working with the journals on the templates to make it easier for the authors when they're writing. The other is when it comes to the submission process to make it easier for authors to submit and to get their work to the destination that they need to. And um, we have a few different types of integration, which I'll, I'll come on to in a second. Um, but I just wanted to highlight the templates again first. So often the, the publishers will feature the template on their author guidelines page. Um, so, you know, typically an author will go to the journal, find out how they can, you know, what is needed for when they're writing their article. And, and PNAS here, you can see links to the latex template on Overleaf. Um, you'll also notice that we, we um, provide our support information as well. Again, if there are latex questions um, that come in uh, that we can help with, um, that's something that, that we can, we can help, help the authors with to, to make it easier for them to write, write their papers and submit to the journal. And then when it comes to submission, we have a few different types of integration. Some are very simple where we provide the author with a way to download all of the files they need um, and point them to the submission portal. Um, and so they just upload them there. And because they've got all the files they need, it helps avoid missing files. And it helps, you know, again, it helps them avoid, you know, missing out some of the things they need to do when they, when they upload them. Um, but in some of the cases, we've got a, a more deeper integration um, where actually by connecting together some APIs, we are actually able to pass the files directly um, behind the scenes. So if you click submit to F1000 research, you aren't asked to download anything. And um, once you confirm that you want to submit, the article files get passed behind the scenes. We also pass across some metadata, um, like the article title and the author information. Um, and this just reduces the amount of information that the author has to fill out manually on the form. So it makes it easier for the author to then complete their submission more quickly rather than having to sort of rewrite things out on the form or you know type things out again. Um, so again, it's just about saving the author, the author some time. I realize this is a publishing audience, but I, I just wanted to highlight some of what we do at the university um, before I get into the um, onto the live demo. Uh, mainly because we do work with a lot of universities around the world. Um, they provide Overleaf out to their students um, and their researchers and their faculty. Um, and it's through these sort of, through working with the universities that we also help the researchers have access to all of the premium features on Overleaf, which again helps them when they're writing their papers for submission. Um, one of the things we do provide then is some statistics on usage. So again, at a university, they can see that this is being taken up, this is being used, um, and, and that this is, you know, something that the, the users are benefiting from. Um, and, and as you expect, analytics, you know, are updated daily, and so you can see changes over time. And one of the things we do on a similar note for publishers is we provide similarly anonymized statistics for usage of templates. So um, if a publisher launches a new template on Overleaf, they can see um, some of the metrics uh, as they change over time. So they can see how many projects have been created from that template, um, how many users are using that template. Um, so they can get an idea of, you know, are, are people finding this, are they using it, and, and sort of then match it up with the information they have on their side about the number of submissions that they have. Um, to highlight some of the institutional um, use, there's a few case studies that I won't go into detail on here, but um, Stanford was our first institutional customer 
um, back in uh, 2015, they saw a, a close to 500% increase in usage in the first year. And it's now used by around 14,000 students, researchers, staff and faculty there. And um, uh, the rollout at institutions is very easy. Um, it's, it's very sort of low admin. We set up the portal and we set up the upgrades and um, basically it's applied automatically to the users when they confirm their affiliation. Um, the, the university admins can also see data on um, what different departments are using Overleaf. And the reason I wanted to highlight this here is because traditionally LaTeX is associated with computer science, mathematics, physics, engineering disciplines. But what actually um, Stanford and other places are seeing is that as it spreads through the university, it's actually spreading out to more fields and more disciplines as well. So the School of Medicine is one that at Stanford, Helen, the librarian at the engineering librarian noticed that there was usage picking up in the School of Medicine, um, which was a bit surprising to her. She didn't realize that they, they use LaTeX. Um, so she was able to then talk with her colleagues at the library um, in the School of Medicine and, and arrange some workshops and um, help that growth and help that usage there. Um, so I think Overleaf is helping to spread the use of LaTeX throughout more disciplines than might traditionally have been expected to use to use LaTeX. Um, and there's, there's additional analytics that help provide the university there with, with a wider picture of usage, you know, going both from the types of role that use it and also the, the collaborating universities that the, the university is working with. Um, I just wanted to add this here as a case study, because um, although it's a university one, it does relate to um, the editorial process. So Purdue University Graduate School were particularly interested in Overleaf because they typically saw quite a lot of turnaround that was needed back and forth on getting a, a, a student's thesis ready to publish from when the, when the students submitted it to them initially. The editorial staff at the graduate school had to do a lot of work with the student to fix, fix references, fix formatting, you know, do a lot of back and forth to make it ready for publishing. And so typically they found they needed you know, five or more meetings with each student um, in order to get the thesis ready. And the reason they wanted to encourage the use of Overleaf was because they found that when students use Overleaf with a LaTeX template for their thesis, they actually needed much less help um, and much less corrections at the end from an editorial perspective. So they reduced those five or more meetings down to two to three per thesis, which doesn't sound very much on its own, but when you think that they have 1,400 of these things to, to process every year, um, and getting around 500 of them written in Overleaf saves around 1,000 meetings, uh, which saves them a huge amount of time. Um, and this is a similar thing that translates into um, you know, journal use, and a bit like with the Genetic Society example at the start, by, get, by getting LaTeX submissions in, through Overleaf, it can help reduce the amount of back and forth with the authors um, and, and help get the things published more quickly and more easily. And um, there are other benefits for a university. So again, if there's anyone in, in the audience who's at a university and interested, um, there's more details on the slides that'll be shared around at the end. And just before we get to the live demo, um, I just wanted to highlight one other use case, which I thought was might be particularly interesting um, for the audience today. So. Um, any physicists in the audience may well recognize this picture. Um, this is the, the tunnel at CERN you know, with the Large Hadron Collider. Um, so CERN is a, is a user of Overleaf uh, and, and um, as you can imagine, they, they have a lot of um, very collaborative projects. Um, indeed, you may, you may remember some of the, the very large ones that are highlighted um, because the, the sort of tradition in, in high energy physics and, and in physics in general is to um, name all of the people involved in an experiment on the paper because it's a write-up of that, that big experiment. Um, some of their papers have thousands of authors. And, and whilst not every one of those is writing parts of the section, you can imagine that they need to do a lot of work to make sure everyone has had a chance to look at it, provide comments, provide feedback. And so they have a very um, complex process and a, and a very, you know, it takes a long time to write a paper 
And so they were looking for tools that, that could help you know, make, that, make that process simpler. Um, just to highlight the collaborative nature at CERN, so this is a snapshot from one of their videos, which is showing the computing grid and the different universities around the world accessing um, the, the Hadron Collider compute data. Um, and you can see like at any one time, there are hundreds of universities around the world um, working with the CERN data and working on, on the CERN experiments. So back in 2016, CERN was looking to adopt a single collaborative authoring tool to provide to their researchers. Um, they conducted a year long trial of three platforms and um, Overleaf emerged as the best fit. Um, and much like we see at universities, the launch of Overleaf at CERN was, was really successful because usage grew from the ground up, from the researchers themselves, you know, signing up for this once it was rolled out um, to include more than uh, three and a half thousand CERN members across many different departments and specialities. Um, and, and I think that's one of the key things is that it is across different departments and specialities. And so they have different people from different types of the research spectrum and, and different types of experiments using Overleaf and adapting it to them. Because Overleaf is very flexible to fit into the workflows um, that different groups have. Um, there's a snapshot of the portal on Overleaf. So again, with any institutional license, um, or, or you know, license like this one for CERN. There's a there's a place for the the uh, the, the members to go to uh, to access things like templates and, and information. And just to give a snapshot, this is what one of the CERN report templates looks like on Overview. So as you can see, it's, I mean, it's quite similar to the um, journal templates that you'd be familiar with. Um, uh, and you can see the files on the left hand side, and then the, the sort of typeset output, which is very simple. Um, and it's it's not um, it's not a fancy layout, but it it means that they have a nice consistent layout for for the different reports that they use. And I've left this quote here um, from Patrick, who is on the editorial board for the LHCB uh, experiment, and it, he's been very enthusiastic about Overleaf, and he's actually one of the people featured in the case study. Um, and there's a link to it on these slides. So if you're interested in that case study, you can um, you can read more about it um, through that link. Just one final thing before I get to the get to the demo. Um, we have been um, providing some free upgrades on Overleaf for individual researchers who needed them during the pandemic. Um, it's coming to an end at the end of June, um, but if anyone on the call here is a researcher or knows someone that would benefit, um, you can find out a little bit more about these individual upgrades that we're providing through the link at the end of the slide. And that's, that's the end of the presentation part. I don't know if we want questions now, Igor, if you'd like me to just take a look at some of the, some of the functionality on the site. Please carry on to uh, the uh, live demo and uh, while I'm collecting the questions in Q&A section. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so hopefully um, you can now see my, my browser window. Um, yep. So this is the home page again, just, just for if anyone was, was curious. Um, just before I sort of dive into things, I'll show a couple of the things that I showed on the slide. So this is the gallery of LaTeX templates. So we have new templates being published and submitted um, all the time, whether they're new templates that are being published for the first time or whether it's updated templates um, that are being published again. So actually, this is one from the Optical Society. So again, we've done quite a lot of work with the Optical Society, um, which is a, you know, a journal. Um, and we've done a lot of work with them on the templates, on the submission system. And again, this is one way you can directly submit to, um, uh, to the journal once you've, uh, once you've written your paper. I, I'll open that as a template um, and just show you how it works. So I've just clicked on open as template, it's bringing it up in the Overleaf editor. You can see I can switch to rich text mode and see it in more of a uh, with less of the less of the code there and more of just being able to write in more WYSIWYG style of view, or we can switch back to to the source mode and write in full LaTeX. Um, you can see on the left hand on the right hand side, sorry, a preview of the finished article. And um, because this is one that we do uh, in partnership with a journal, we have some journal branding in the editor so that the author can you know sees that continuity from, from the journal. And there is a submit to the OSA 
um, option um, where the author can, can log in and, and download the files they need and, and submit to the journal. And again, so this is all set up with the journal. Um, and again, it helps make it much easier for, for them to receive papers. Um, I also wanted to highlight that um, Overleaf is multilingual, uh, both in the spell check, but then also in the types of paper that we have. Um, so you can see I've, I've searched for uh, Russian um, gallery items here. Um, so you can see you have a mixture of um, journal templates or, or thesis templates, um, and they're all using, uh, most of these are submitted by um, individual users, either based at that university or who, who write papers for those conferences. So again, this isn't something that, that we're trying to produce internally, um, but it's something that the community is producing um, or the community is sharing um, and helping making it easier. Um, I have one of these loaded up in, in the Overleaf editor. Um, and so again, you can use the full alphabet, you can write um, and compile in, in, in Russian. I should add it, it is multilingual, so sometimes you need, need two languages in. Um, and you can do that, you can do that very easily. Um, and the, the nice thing about the editor is that, you know, if we were collaborating on this document, you know, I could share this link with you um, or share the paper with you and you could write your section, I could write my section and we could both collaborate very easily as an international, um, international, you know, duo or international um, collaboration. I wanted to, to quickly highlight the, the Learn Wiki as well. Um, and then obviously if there's specific things people would like then we can look at those. But I did just want to highlight the sort of Learn LaTeX in 30 Minutes guide because I know sometimes when you hear the word LaTeX, um, it sounds very scary and it sounds like it's something that you, how, how could you learn that? That's, that's very difficult. It is actually very simple now. Um, I think a lot of the barriers to using it, which were around um, installing it properly and, and getting things to compile properly and keeping things updated um, are no longer an issue because we handle that at Overleaf. Um, so this guide will let you pick up the basics of creating an article, creating a document, adding title, author and date, um, and getting all the way to having a, a, you know, a, an initial paper ready there with figures in, with references in and lists in and, and all the things you might need in your paper, you know, mathematics equations. Um, and this is intended to be completed in around half an hour and, and you know, give or take. Some people whiz through these things very quickly. Um, some people take a bit longer. Um, but maybe now is a good time just to, rather than um, uh, me um, just pointing at things, maybe take a few questions and, and see what, what people would like to see. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, well, the first question is, how can you create a template for my own journal? Um, is there a documentation for it? And if so, where do I find it? It's a question from Sergey Michalovic. Yes, so that's a great question. So um, I guess I would say if you have a LaTeX template that you've already used, that you already have, um, or that's been used in the past, you can upload it to Overleaf. Um, so if you are in your projects dashboard and you want to create a new project, you can upload it. So if you already have an existing template, you can you can create, you can upload it to Overleaf there. Um, and then, sorry, let me just go back to here. And so then if you, once you have it, you can submit it to the Overleaf gallery, uh, which will be when this loads up. Oh, I should pick a different one. Let's pick this one. Uh, I can't show it on this one because this doesn't have the, um, let me open another example. Um, and you can submit it to the Overleaf Gallery, um, which will make it available to all the different authors, um, which I will show. Here we go. There we go. So if you click Submit to the Overleaf Gallery, let's say this, say, let's say this was my template. Um, this is how I would how I would submit it to the gallery to make it available to people. If you haven't created a, a template before, um, we are working on some more guidelines. I think you can either, um, uh, you can either, sorry, here is a, 
here is a, a, a sort of a, a sort of short guide to what I just showed you about submitting it to the gallery. Um, if you've never worked, if you've never created a LaTeX template before, um, you can get in touch with us, and we can help create a LaTeX template with you based on on the requirements. Or um, there are many sort of typesetters that would create a, a journal-based template for you. Um, so again, I would say it just depends a little bit on what experience you've had with with LaTeX before as to what the best way of doing doing it is. Thanks, John. Um, there is another question uh, from anonymous attendee. Uh, where can I see templates for the journals in Russian language? Do you have a corresponding list of those journals in your system? So that, that is a good question. So, so this is all the items tagged with Russian. And um, if I switch it to templates, this should just pick up templates. And so this, this list here, it, it, it won't be just journal templates because there will be thesis templates in here as well. Um, but it's not hugely long at the moment because I don't think we have a huge number of, of Russian language journal templates in there at the moment. So this, this link would probably be the best one to use um, to have a look at what we already have in here that's, that's in the Russian language. Um, and you can see some of my conference templates as well. Um, and if we don't have a particular template, um, we can add it to the gallery, especially if the if the journal already has a LaTeX template. So, you know, I would again reach out to Igor or, or you know, let us know, and we can see if we can add that template to the to the gallery. Um, but this is probably the best link to look in the first instance. Okay, thanks, John. Another question from uh, Natalia: um, Can you add um, a template of your own journal or journals into the platform if uh, the um, publishing house or a publisher is working with this um, with this platform with over you uh, so yes so effectively um, the way we do it is you know a lot of journals have their own existing latex templates um, and, and they already have one and so we can just work with a journal to have it help get it uploaded if needed um, and there is a subscription service which provides this branded link and the dedicated submission route. Um, but if the journal has the template and they just want to upload it, um, they can upload it for free just by following this guide. Um, effectively, if they, if they don't need input from us on the template um, and it's ready to go, they can submit it and make it available in the gallery um, and do that themselves. Um, and then we provide this subscription service which helps and provide the branded links, the, the sub direct submission links, and, and a few other things as well. Um, so definitely, if, if a journal already has a LaTeX template, it is really easy to get it into the gallery that they can follow these steps or get, just help um, get that done. Um, if they don't have a LaTeX template yet, um, like if they still get in touch, um, if it's something simple or it's something that, that we can work on, we're happy to do that. Or like I say, there are other typesetters that will create um, create LaTeX templates as well um, from from say Word templates or from other other templates that you have. And where do you draw the um, the um, kind of the line? Uh, what you could do for free and what you could do when you have a relationship already with with the publishers specifically and regarding the templates of the journals. So it's a good, great question. So effectively, the, there's a couple of things. So, I mean, first of all, on the free service, because anyone can submit templates. So like I say, many of the templates here are community um, generated, like they're, they're created by people um, who submit them to the gallery. Um, and, and effectively, they, they are then responsible for that template. Um, like we provided it compiles, like we don't check to make sure the LaTeX is is good if you like or, or we don't provide any input on that um, and so effectively if if the journal doesn't need any input from us and is quite comfortable and has LaTeX expertise on board um, then, then they can do that for free and what a lot of journals like to do is for us to help um, look at the template perhaps make some updates to make it easier for authors to use um, and do do some of that work so that's part of the paid service and um, the other point is these these sort of submission links. So again, adding this branding, adding in this submission to the journal link so that, you know, this is the, this template, the Optical Society one, will be linked from their website. 
Um, and when they click through to that link, they'll get to the template landing page. And when they open it up, they'll see the branded version with a specific submission link. Um, and this is part of the paid service. Whereas a general project has this general submission link. So I can still submit to a journal here, but I have to search for it. Um, it's not kind of as streamlined in. Um, and there's a few other things we do as well. Um, again, if you if the journal uses a particular journal manuscript management system like eJournal Press or Scholar One or Editor or Manager, then on the paid service, we can interact directly with it to pass the files across automatically. So the, the integrations are part of the paid service and, and the sort of um, more streamlined, more branded, more, more um, sort of um, more, you know, more integrated service um, is, is, is part of the paid subscription. Thanks, John. I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate that in Russian so that everyone uh, is, is clear on this because it's important. Um, дорогие коллеги, вот uh, я специально задал вопрос Джону, um, в чем, где вот как бы красная линия между тем, что платформа и команда Overleaf дает как бы, всем просто так, и где вот начинается уже um, как бы взаимодействие договорного свойства. Значит, вот создание, um, если у вас в вашем журнале или в вашем университете или в вашем издательстве коллеги смогут создать вот этот вот шаблон самостоятельно, то разместить его на платформе можно просто так. То есть таким образом вы как бы получаете ну, гигантский, гигантское окно в мир, где вот 5 миллионов пользователей как бы увидят, по крайней мере текущих, увидят шаблон вашего журнала. Если это журнал на, там, на английском языке, понятно, что большее количество, если на русском, то ну, десятки тысяч текущих пользователей его тоже увидят. То есть вы расширитесь таким образом такую базу авторов, наверное, и облегчите им и себе работу по работе вот уже с, с реальным шаблоном вашего издательства или вашего журнала. Если же потребуется вот помощь команды Overleaf, где вот вы скажете, нет, мы не хотим там, возиться с разбиранием с LayTech, да? мы хотим, чтобы вы нам все это сделали. И, например, вы также захотите, как вот Optical Society, сделать автоматизированную интеграцию, когда вот шаблон статьи, здесь уже прям по кнопке можно, уже когда все написано, можно подать вот напрямую, минуя всякие вот сложности, напрямую в, в издательство. Вот, вот это как бы часть интегрирования workflow, она уже будет как бы на, на контрактной основе. Надеюсь, это как бы поможет коллегам. Uh, John, uh, thanks. I've, I've just reiterated this uh, in, uh, in Russian because that's, that's an important one. Um, есть ли еще вопросы, уважаемые коллеги? Пишите в чат и в Q&A. У нас есть, есть время. I'm just looking at um, the Q&A section because we've so far answered all the questions. John. So maybe um, maybe any other uh, publisher or editor specific um, uh, unique features you'd like to to add on top of this, John? Yeah. So I think um, like like I said, one of the nice things um, about the document being on Overleaf, and one of the things that the Optical Society in particular find helpful is previously. Um, before they worked with Overleaf, they had a lot of issues where an author would have the, the article compile and look okay on their machine, on their computer. But when they would submit it to the journal, the journal wouldn't be able to compile it properly or it wouldn't quite look the same. And it would be very hard for the, the journal and the author to fix that because from the author's perspective, it looks fine. Um, and it was only from the journal's perspective that it didn't. So it would be very hard to fix that problem. Um, now, because the, 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 the author's paper is on Overleaf, the editor and the, the author can both see the same version. So if there is an issue, they both know that they can see the same thing. You know, the, uh, the editor could leave a comment very easily. So he could say, you know, this, um, this is, uh, this needs a citation perhaps. And, um, and then it's very easy for, you know, the author to be very clear on what the issue was and, and how to fix it. So 
I think from an editorial perspective, like when things go right, everything's fine. When an author submits a paper that's, that's, that's okay, that's good, that has all the files needed, um, that can go through very quickly. The challenge is always in those cases where it doesn't go right first time. And tra the traditional ways of fixing that involve a lot of back and forth. Um, I think Oblief helps reduce that. It makes the submissions more consistent and reduces the amount of back and forth. So I think that's a particular um, advantage to Oblief is it just helps avoid misunderstandings between the authors uh, and the editors. Thanks, John. Um, and I think two more questions. One is from anonymous attendee. Does concise course of LaTeX uh, is available um, uh, at Overleaf website? Yes. So uh, if you go to overleaf.com forward slash learn, and this is our documentation wiki. And then at the very top of this page is a link to the Learn LaTeX in 30 Minutes guide. Um, the one other thing I will also point out is if you search for an introduction, uh, an introduction to later, you'll find a three-part series um, on this, which was actually created by my co-founder, John Lees Miller. Um, and this is an introduction which is formatted as a series of slides. So you can download these slides as a PDF. Um, if you if you want to, um, these slides are also open source, um, and you can see they've already been translated into some other languages. Um, so there is a Russian um, translation available of this LaTeX course. So um, uh, the link didn't seem to. I can't see Sorry, the Russian version. Um, but number four. No, it was. It was under uh, RU, the small uh, fourth. Uh, yes. Once you, once you do that. Yeah, so rule, uh, number four from the top. There we go. Yes. So you can see I've just, this is this is in the re, in the repository. Um, but so someone has taken these slides um, and translated them into Russian. Um, and this is a particularly nice course because it takes you through all of the things that you need to know. Um, but then it gives you some exercises to do in the browser. So you can open the example document in Overleaf. Um, and I'll just go down to one of the exercises. So here there's an exercise to open. And um, then you can also open to see the solution. So you can see, you can give it a try. And then you can also see the, the solution to that. Um, and like I say, yeah, you can you can look at the the, the Russian language version of this um and um you know you can um share this it's a pdf um so you can share it with others you can use it for workshops they're completely free and open um there's no there's no license it's the mit license so you're, you're free and welcome to do do what you like with them um, and these are really nice short courses for getting people used to latex if they've if they've not used it before and um, like I say, if you go to the Learn Wiki and, and search for Introduction to LaTeX, you can find it there. Or um, if you if you struggle, just get in touch with with Igor or myself, and we'll point it out. Thanks, John. Um, I think one more thing is is would be would be beneficial to to highlight. Um, can you mention um, the in, um, the integrations that LaTeX has? Well, not LaTeX, Overleaf has with other products uh, or um, you know products of um, other vendors, other platforms, um, such as, you know, I don't know, Mendeley or um, any other integration. So just give a, uh, give a wide kind of overview of what kind of integrations are available. Absolutely. So um, uh, we have a few different integrations in Overleaf, um, both um, for helping bring content into Overleaf or as a researcher to help you work with with content that you have here. So um, Igor mentioned Mendeley, um, which is a nice example. So um, if, you, if, you, if you're a researcher, you often have a bibliography file there and, and often you'll use a reference manager to manage that. And then two of the popular ones are Mendeley and Zotero. Um, you can link um, to Mendeley or link to Zotero. And then that lets you bring in your um, bibliography file um, from Mendeley. And then if you add more references to Mendeley, let's say you, know, you, you, you add some new references, you can then refresh 
and, and bring that back in. And if I just go Overleaf Mendeley, um, you should see there's a few different um, guides to it. If I just click on this one, um, you can see some, some of the screenshots. So you're taken to Mendeley to, to confirm, you know, you have to link your accounts. Um, and then when you pull a bibliography file in, um, you can pull it in from a group or from your own, your own master file. And it means that then when you're trying to cite things, you can cite things directly from your, um, your reference library. Um, and, you know, it auto completes the citation for you. So it, it makes it really easy if you're an author to cite, um, cite different things. So, so those reference manager integrations um, are very useful if you're a researcher um, as well. Um, we also have a few other integrations for bringing in other things to your project. So you can use um, Git to sort of pull a local version um, and, and include sort of your overly project as part of, let's say it's a wider project with, you know, data resources and other things that, you know, it's a sort of, it's a, it's a separate module. Um, you, can, you can use that. So again, as a researcher, you're often using other tools. And so those are a couple of nice things um, that you can do. Um, we do also have, like I said, some of the integrations with um, journals, uh, submission systems. Um, so if I can um, just remember one, I think um, has this. So, so this is um, an example of a direct submission link. So here, and I search for MNRES, which is my astro, it's an astrophysics journal. Um, so here you notice it doesn't ask me to download the files. That's because um, what if I click continue, it's going to take me through to Scholar One. Um, uh, well, it gives me a confirmation screen. Um, and then it will send the information through um, to their Scholar One site. And then I'll go to that site and I will log in. And I won't do this here because it's a test project and, and I don't want to um, send them a test project. Um, but you can you know, you can submit to, uh, to, to a journal directly without having to go through the download, the download step. There is um, a question. One other, one other yeah. integration that is not quite here yet, but it's coming very soon. And we should soon have a, a beta version of a, a, a rightful plugin. Um, so for, for help with language specific checking, um, that should be available as a Chrome extension in beta very soon. Um, so again, that will help, um, you know, with things like grammar checking. Um, within the editor. John, there is a question about EndNote. Um... Yes. Um, so EndNote is, is, is very popular. Um, and you can use EndNote with Overleaf. Um, so there is, if you search for EndNote Overleaf, you can find a short help guide. Um, and it's just, it's just not an integrated um, link. So you just have to go into EndNote, export the reference file, and then just upload it. Um, into Overleaf. So there's a little guide here um, as to how to do it. So it just requires maybe a couple of steps rather than just the one um, with Mendeley or Zotero. Thanks, John. Um, maybe you could uh, at the end highlight, well, oh, actually, I think there is, yeah, there are, there are more questions. Um, do you think that the thousands of templates for journals will be, um, you know, shrinking to dozens at some point? It's a question from Tatiana. It's a great question. Yeah, like, is, is more templates more more helpful or not? Um, I guess I guess template means different things to different people. So, um, in some cases, it helps with the formatting and it helps make it look like the finished sort of camera ready article. Uh, but in other cases, it's actually just providing the author with some guidelines, you know, mainly providing them with guidelines on what to do. So within the article, within the template itself, it, it has the, the example section headers and, and, and some of the requirements in terms of, you know, data accessibility statements and things. So really, I think they should be viewed as they are, they are there to try and help people, you know, put together the information that's required for a, either a particular journal or, a, you know, if you're writing your thesis, all the things that are required there. And, and there, there are always some specific things um, related to, to specific journals. Um, I think what we would like to see and, and what we're trying to do as we work on new templates is, is to make them as simple as possible for authors so that there are, 
there really are less hoops to jump through and, and really it's just helping the authors provide like the information that's needed. Um, so yeah, I think if it, if, it, if it could be reduced down, I think that's a good thing. And actually the Optical Society is a great example there. So they did quite a bit of work to create a universal manuscript template for their journals. So rather than having lots of separate ones, um, this journal template now covers um, all the different journals. And because there are some specific things to particular journals, there is a little toggle where you choose the particular journal um, that you're in and you can change that to something else. Um, but that's all it is. And it's just making very lightweight changes to how it looks like that. For example, just change the color of the, of the author names and, and, and a few other things. Um, but you know, I, I, I agree. You, having a separate template for every journal isn't, um, isn't necessarily where we want to be. Um, so it's trying to find that balance between giving the authors the information they need and trying to keep it simple. Okay. Thanks. Um, thanks, John. Uh, I'm just trying to see if there are any more questions uh, coming our way. Um, well, I think I think that's. Um, oh, there are two more. Uh, for using Overleaf, one should have LaTeX installed on the computer. Does journal have to have that in use as well? So you, if, you're, if you're an author, you don't have to have LaTeX installed. Um, you can run it all um, through the browser. So this is all in the browser. If I hit this recompile button here, it's running LaTeX on our server, well, not on our servers, but on servers in the cloud um, that are uh, compiling the document. So you don't need to have LaTeX installed on your computer. Um, if you're a publisher, um, uh, it, it depends, I think, is the answer. Some uh, don't need to use uh, have LaTeX installed because they, um, they use the Overleaf compilers and, and they, you know, they rely on the fact that Overleaf provides the, the compiled documents. Um, some journals do still have internal LaTeX installations because they, they like to have that and, and, it, and it's sort of something that they, they're very used to. So I think it depends a little bit, but for an author, um, no, you don't have to have LaTeX installed unless you want to. Thanks, John. Um, and two, two last questions. One is, uh, what if paper is transferred from the previous journal to a journal with a different template? That's number one. And number two, um, what do you think of um, trials for uh, institutions or publishers uh, for that matter? Thank you. Yeah, so, so picking up on the first question, um, Usually, chat transferring it from one journal to another will involve changing this particular file, the class file, um, and just changing this document class at the start. So you see that says there, document class OSA article, um, and that's referencing this particular file. Um, if you were submitting it, say, a Springer journal, um, you would need to pick up the Springer class file and, and put this in. So at the moment, you do need to know a bit of LaTeX in order to do that. Um, but it is pretty, it is usually quite simple um, in that it's changing a few commands. Um, sometimes, depending on how complex your article is, you might need to do a little bit of work when it's, when it's converted over, but it is much simpler than having to manually change everything um, like, you, like you would have to in Word. Um, so it is, it is reasonably simple, uh, but at the moment you do need to know a little bit of LaTeX in order to do it. Um, in terms of trials, so uh, just to say, as, as an author, um, you can use Overleaf for free. Um, that's just just wanted to make that clear. We have a free freemium model for authors, so um, uh, you can use it for free, or you can upgrade um, individually. Um, for institutions, we we normally run it as a you know look to set up like a three year license and discount the first year. Um, as, a, as a sort of way to help roll it out and to help um, with that initial ramp up. And with publishers, again, I think it depends on, on the work that's required, um, essentially. If there's, if there's upfront work that's required, then usually we would need to have that as part of a contract. But if, um, if you already have a LaTeX template, then obviously you can set that up in Overleaf and, and you know, get started with that, with that simple um, setup. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, 
И для в завершения я просто скажу, что мы договорились с командой Джона Хаммерсли о том, что если будет необходимость в организации тестовых доступов, ну, например, там для 50, 100 или 150 человек в одной организации, мы можем также такую штуку сделать. И в ином случае есть, как Джон уже показал, индивидуальные как бы, такие вот возможности, но там они чуть-чуть ограничены, и как бы там не предусмотрено большого количества соавторов. То есть вот уровень сотрудничества внутри как бы свободного аккаунта, он, ну, как бы, естественно, каким-то образом ограничен. Хотя, по большому счету, можно попробовать и так, и так. Поэтому я приглашаю издательство, университеты, если есть желание организовать централизованный тестовый период, мы будем готовы об этом поговорить. Вот. Спасибо большое Джону, спасибо Анри и Ольге Владимировне. Запись этого вебинара будет предоставлена всем участникам. Спасибо большое за замечательные вопросы. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, John, and uh, uh, to the association presidents uh, who helped organize this all. We uh, have been recording this webinar and will be providing it to uh, everyone who registered. Um, and if there are any centralized trial requests, we'll be taking that uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Спасибо большое. Uh, до следующих встреч. У нас еще предстоит два uh, мастер-класса в uh, серии с Анри uh, на ближайшую неделю. Спасибо. До свидания.